Ani Boshu Nin Shannon Indigenicas Bawating and Dojuba. Hello, my name is Shannon Eplett. I'm a PhD candidate in theater history and criticism at University of Illinois, and I'm also an enrolled member of the Sault Ste. Marie tribe of Chippewa Indians. The work I'm talking about today is an idea for a devised theater piece based on the life of Jane Johnston Schoolcraft. This piece originated as a final project in a course in indigenous performance taught by Joy Harjo at University of Illinois in 2013. And the initial assignment was to create a short performance piece based on your own cultural background, whatever that might be. So I decided to look into the history of my own tribe, and I came upon Jane Johnston Schoolcraft. So she interested me for several reasons. First of all, I was somewhat familiar with her, or rather her husband, Henry Rowe Schoolcraft. So Henry was the first U.S. Indian agent at Sault Ste. Marie. He was also an early ethnologist. He published several books on Native American culture and language. Secondly, I realized that my own family, my ancestors, had lived at Sault Ste. Sioux at the same time that Jane lived there, and they very probably knew each other. What I created was later performed at Figure One Gallery in Champaign in March of 2014. And then last summer, I received a fellowship to the Newberry Consortium for American Indian Studies at the Newberry Library in Chicago. And I used that time to conduct further research to expand what had originally been a five minute performance piece into an evening length work. So what I'm presenting today is uh, a presentation on the research for a play that has not yet been written or performed. So this is very much a work in progress. So I found that University of Illinois professor Robert Dale Parker had published a book on Jane called The Sound the Stars Make Rushing Through the Sky, which came out in 2012. He focused on Jane as a poet, and he says, quote, Eclipsed from the historical record by her famous husband, Henry Rose Schoolcraft, Jane Johnston Schoolcraft was nevertheless among the first American Indian writers. She was also the first known American Indian literary writer, the first known Indian woman writer, by some measures the first known Indian poet, the first known poet to write poems in a Native American language, and the first known American Indian to write out traditional Indian stories, as opposed to transcribing and translating from someone else's oral delivery, which she also did. Her stories became a key source for Henry Wadsworth Longfellow's sensational bestseller, The Song of Hiawatha. So it is through Henry's archive that we have Jane's writing, that her work survives. Jane has no archive. Uh, she never published. All we know about her comes from Henry's writing and from his archive, which is huge. And thanks to Robert Dale Parker at U of I, U of I has Henry's archive. It's, the original is housed in the Library of Congress, but U of I has it on microfilm. So at the Newberry, I decided to spend my time looking for her Jane's work, Jane's writing, in the work of other writers. And I found a lot. So here's our main character, Jane Johnson Schoolcraft. Her Anishinaabe name is Bamawawa Kajikakwe, a woman of the sound stars make rushing through the sky. She lived from 1800 to 1842. She lived most of her life at Sault Ste. Marie and Mackinac Island, Michigan. She later lived at Detroit and she died, and also in New York City, and she died near Niagara Falls, Ontario. So we have our setting. This is the social setting for the work, is the middle ground. Uh, Parker frames Jane's life within the context of the middle ground, which comes from a book by Richard White. He presents the middle ground as, um, as a meeting of equals between Native Americans, the French, and the English within the fur trade. So it created an interdependent Métis or Creole culture that was equal parts French, Native American, and English. And Jane and her family were very much products of this. So we also have our cast of characters. So Jane's father, John Johnston, was born in Ireland. And he came to the US when he was in his late 20s and entered the fur, tra fur trade. He married Ojagas Kedewekwe. She was the daughter of Chief Wabaji. Her name means woman of the green prairie. And her English name was Susan Johnston, but she was also called Ninge, which is Anishinaabe for mother. She was born at Chiquamagon, which is near Madeline Islands, Wisconsin. Her marriage to Johnston brought them to the Sioux, and, which is where their trading post was. He remained a British citizen, and he fought against the US in the War of 1812. But he was not a typical fur trader. He was English, he's Protestant, he was educated, and he loved his wife. Theirs was not a typical fur trade marriage 
um, it was a real marriage. Fur trade marriages tended to be more like economic arrangements between European men and Native women. This was a real marriage. He loved her. Um, Ninge kept a proper English household for her husband, but she also kept her traditional ways. She understood English, but she never spoke it, and her children were, ra were raised to be fluent in Anishinaabe Moen French and English cultures. She was as important in the Metis culture of Sault Ste. Marie as was her husband. They were the power couple of Sault Ste. Marie in their time. Uh, their eldest daughter, Jane, they had eight children. Jane was the eldest daughter. She was the third child. She married U.S. Indian agent Henry Rose Schoolcraft in 1823. And she loved and married the man whose responsibility it was to disenfranchise her people. Their first child, William Henry, or Panacee, was born in 1824 and died of whooping cough at age three. Um, Jane also had a stillborn daughter in 1825, and then their surviving children, Jamie was born in 1828, and John in 1829. Uh, Jane may have also had other miscarriages as well, but much of her poetry focused on her children, her family, and especially the death of her first child, Lily. So next we have our setting. Um, Sault Ste. Marie is a rapids in the St. Mary's River, close out. It's a portage point. Uh, the city lies on both sides of the river. Today there's the American and the Canadian Sioux. But the spot had always been the site of Indian villages. Uh, the War of 1812 occurred when Jane was 12 years old, and the war settled the U.S. border as the middle of the river. So the Johnstons lived on the American side, although her father remained a British citizen. But it took nearly a decade after the War of 1812 for the U.S. government to assert any kind of authority in this area. And that arrived in the form of a military garrison and U.S. Indian agent Henry Rose Schoolcraft. So the Sioux was considered the end of the earth in the 1820s. Henry called it the American Siberia. But with the arrival of American power, the middle ground began to disappear. And the Metis culture, which Jane and her family exemplified, began to fade away as well. So I realized that when I talk about this piece to people who are not familiar with it, they tend to start understanding the story in terms of familiar tropes of Native American women and European men. They tend to think of uh, Pocahontas and Sacagawea and Lana Lynch. But this isn't true. Uh, Jane had agency. She was intelligent. She was educated. She uh, was accomplished in her own right. And as a poet, I think she was on a par with Emily Dickinson. Plus, she wrote in both English and Anishinaabe. However, late in her life, a carpet bag containing her writing went missing from a train station in Albany, New York, and was never found. So she may have written far more than we'll ever know about. Um, and her marriage to Henry was, seems to have been a marriage of equals as much as any marriage would have been in the 1820s. So thinking of Jane as simply an innocent victim of European power or a pawn or something is really reductive. She was not that simple. So I wanted to broaden the picture of Jane, and since we only have her writing through Henry's archive, I looked for accounts of Jane in other sources. So the late 1830s and 1840s were the beginnings of civilian travel in the Great Lakes, and also the beginning of travel writing. And no visit to this area would be complete without paying a visit to the Johnston family or the Schoolcraft family. And so these were some of the accounts that I found. These descriptions of Jane often tell us a lot more about the writer than they do about the subject. So I'm going to read two examples of things that I found, and I'm going to, then I'll talk about why I chose them and how I would stage them. So the first comes from English travel writer Mrs. Anna Jameson. She wrote about meeting Jane in her 1838 book, Winter Studies and Summer Rambles, Summer Rambles in Canada. So she describes accompanying Mrs. Schoolcraft and her children on a canoe trip from their home on Mackinac Island upriver to, to Sault Ste. Marie. So this is not two little Victorian ladies in a, in a rowboat. This is the kind of canoe they would have taken. These were used to portage goods up and down the Great Lakes. So it was rowed, they hired 10 men to row it for them. This was a two-day trip. So it was 10, 10 men, the two women, two children on a two-day trip through the Great North. They were plagued by mosquitoes and clouds of black flies throughout. So this is Mrs. Jameson. I offered an extra gratuity to the men if they would keep to their oars without interruption, and then, fairly exhausted, lay down on my locker and blanket. But whenever I woke from uneasy, restless slumbers, there was Mrs. Schoolcraft bending over her sleeping children and waving off the mosquitoes, singing all the time a low, melancholy Indian song. 
while the northern lights were streaming and dancing in the sky, and the fitful moaning of the wind, the gathering clouds and chilly atmosphere foretold a change in the weather. When daylight came, we passed Sugar Island, where immense quantities of maple sugar are made every spring. And just as the rain began to fall in earnest, we arrived at the Sault Ste. Marie. On one side of the river, Mrs. Schoolcraft was, was welcomed by her mother, and on the other, my friends the McMurrays received me with delighted and delightful hospitality. So her use of imagery, the river is both the route home and it's also the thing that divides the women at the end of the trip, really seemed to signify the end of the middle ground for me. So I could see doing this as a movement piece. It's very erotically charged. There are 14 people in this canoe for two days and the only person Mrs. Jameson writes about is Jane. It's very focused on her. So the movement piece would be two ladies in a rowboat moved about by 10 men. Um, so our next piece comes from Henry's second wife, Mary Howard Schoolcraft. So Henry married the lovely and outspoken slave-owning anti-abolitionist about five years after Jane died. In 1860, and apparently with Henry's blessing, she wrote a book called The Black Gauntlet. This was a novel that was a very thinly disguised autobiography and a vitriolic defense of slavery. It's one of the most insane books I've ever read. So this overheated prose describes the late in life marriage of Miss Musidora Wyndham to Mr. Walsingham, an English ethnologist who studies American Indians. And so on their honeymoon, Musidora learns the details of his first marriage to an Indian woman. The first Mrs. Walsingham charmed high society, wrote poetry, and had two children. However, after he had been married 10 or 15 years and had enjoyed all the sweets of domestic love and harmony, he noticed that his wife's health became alarmingly prostrated and that she almost lived in bed. The best physicians were employed, the best nurses were engaged, and her Indian mother never left her bedside. At last, the horrible fact was elucidated that she had for years indulged excessively in the use of opium until the habit had become the morbid passion of her everyday existence and to hide it from her trusting husband, she had educated her two children in every species of secrecy and cunning to procure the drug for her without their father's knowledge. So although Mary Howard's picture of Jane is really hateful, there is probably some truth in it. Laudanum, an opiate, was commonly prescribed for women suffering from nervous disorders in this era, and addiction was very common. And letters, letters that are in Henry's archive indicate that Jane was using laudanum after 1835 and may very well have been addicted. Um, this could have led to her death in 1842. But the actual evidence of this is really limited. So um, it's within the context of theater, so this could, the Loudon use could explain her lengthy illnesses, which are alluded to but never really named. And also the fact that Henry tried very hard to keep his, their two children in boarding schools and away from their mother for a lot of her life. So presented within the parameters of theater, sort of in brackets, this information can be staged. Uh, this unreliable account can be staged to introduce the element into Jane's story. So I would do this in the style of Charles Ludlum, like a 19th century melodrama with you know dramatic piano music underneath, uh, an actress in red face playing the Indian wife, and then probably a man in drag playing Miss Musidora. So it would be very over the top. So you've heard the characters, the setting, and some plot points. Mrs. Jameson's tale of a canoe voyage from Mackinac to the Sioux suggested a dramatic structure based on the Anishinaabe migration story. And this is where I get the structure from. So this story details the journey of the Anishinaabe people from their original home on the East Coast up the St. Lawrence River and into the Great Lakes. So key points in this, in this myth occur at Niagara Falls, at Detroit, at Mackinac, and Sault Ste. Marie. And some versions of the tale end at Chipomagon, where two bands of, of the tribe are reunited. So this is a migration uh, against the flow of the river from east to west and guided by spirit in advance of Europeans. In contrast, Jane's life story unfolds in the opposite direction. Her mother is born at Chipomagon. She's born at the Sioux. She lives most of her life at the Sioux in Mackinac. She moves to Detroit, and she dies near Ontario, near Niagara Falls, in Ontario. So, the episodes of Jane's story would unfold along this route in, in 
geographic, excuse me, a geographic rather than chronological order. We will essentially see her life unfold in reverse. Um, so the show will begin with a scene based on this poem. So this is a poem that Jane wrote in New York City in 1839. Henry had lost his job in a scandal and moved the family to the East Coast to promote his writing. And the children were put into boarding schools, not an Indian boarding school, but they were placed in boarding school. So her marriage to Henry had gone sour. Jane was missing her children and homesick. This was written near the end of her life in a Nishnabe way. Now Margaret Newton of University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee is an English professor and an Anishinaabe Moen teacher. She recorded this poem as a song, which I used in the original piece. Following this, we'll see an indication of Jane's carpet bag going missing at Albany, followed by a scene of her death at her sister's house near Niagara Falls, and then we'll see scenes of her life based on accounts from, of her at Detroit, Mackinac, Sault Ste. Marie, we'll see the canoe journey with Mrs. Jameson to the Sioux, we'll see her marriage, Willie's death, and so on. The river is, so the river is the framing device and the controlling metaphor for the piece. It's eternal, but it's never still. So we have a visual image, and we can also move with or against its flow, so we have a movement metaphor. It's both a means of conveyance and a boundary. The closing moments of the play will feature Jane's poem, Castle Island, which was written during a visit to Granite Island near Marquette, Michigan in 1839. So this uninhabited island lay just beyond the border of territory ceded by the Anishinaabe in the 1836 treaty. And despite the fact that that treaty provided for reservations, the U.S. Senate instead ordered Indians to be removed from the area within five years. Jane accompanied Henry as he inventoried the region in advance of Indian removal. So here's where history slaps us. I had always thought that my tribe had, not, had never been removed. Our reservation today is at Sault Ste. Marie. It's near where we had always lived. We're not a Trail of Tears tribe. Um, but no, Michigan was in fact the test case for the Indian and Jane's husband, Henry, was an architect of that policy. Maureen Conkle imagines how this visit may have been reflected in Jane's poem, Castle Island, quote, that tiny island in the lake must have seemed the one place white men wouldn't want to take, the last bit of undesired ground, that the island was free of people, including Ojibwe people, is telling. Seeing her people about to be dispossessed once again and at the hands of her husband, was perhaps more than she could endure. And dramatically, this is where Jane leaves this world. Dramatically, that's where she steps out of the piece. As an epilogue, we will see an account originally recorded by Mrs. Jameson of Ninge's vision prior to her marriage to John Johnston. She was reluctant to marry a white man, and she sought a vision to guide her. So Ninge's dream would have, would have occurred at Chiquamaga. So Jane's story begins at the point where the Anishinaabe migration story ends. Stylistically, the staging will appear to be a postmodern treatment with mixed media and fragmented narratives. However, literarily, it is very much in the spirit of Anishinaabe, Anishinaabe storytelling conventions. For example, the Nanabozo stories, which are the source for Hiawatha. There is no definitive Nanabozo story. Instead, there are recurring themes and narratives that can converge or expand as the storyteller scene sees fit. So after hearing several of them, Nanabozo's character emerges in all these contradictions and concordances. So all of them are true, even if none of them are consistent. In the same manner, by presenting a plurality of depictions of Jane and her story, we get a full, if unstable, picture. And this is also a work of survivance, Gerald Weisner's term. 
quote, the theories of survivance are elusive by definition, but the nature of survivance is unmistakable, a narrative resistance that creates a sense of presence over absence. He's also said it's an active presence, a struggle against the forgetting, uprooting, and eradication. So in telling this story of a woman coming apart within, within a marriage, we can unfold this greater historical narrative. So why put this on stage? Why not just write a book, write a paper? Um, we all know that live theater is an exchange. We sit in a room together and we feel things. And some things, I think, uh, need to be felt in order to be understood. So staging Jane's story reinscribes her into a world that tried to erase her. Jane's story is a reminder that we are still here. 